Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal here is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So Andrew, can you believe that we've been doing podcasts now for over a year? This is episode 80. 80? Wow. Wow. When do we finish? (laughs) That's a good question. But today I'm supposed to be asking you the question. Oh, that's right on the Ask Andrew Anything. Ask Andrew Anything. Can we just rephrase that to Ask Andrew Almost Anything? (laughs) I think think for today we can because we have a lot more questions that we're going to have time to answer. So in the spirit of let's just get it done, let's start asking the questions. Amy asks, what advice would you give to a homeschool mom who is overwhelmed with the prospect of giving her high school student a quality education? And it sounds like she's got kids of all ranges, age ranges. So how can she give a quality education? Well, there's three directions you could go with a question like this. Mm -hmm. The first question is give up and put your kid in school. But then you'd have to find a city that you would move to that would have a really extraordinary school like Hillsdale, Michigan, or (laughs) Louisville, Kentucky, or some miserable place like that. (laughs) Because there are some truly great schools, Chesterton Academy in Minneapolis. I mean, there are a few times when, you know, I've been traveling and met schools and teachers, and I thought, wow, I would practically move here for my kids to go to this school. Well, and I'd like to think that the number of schools that are getting to be of that caliber are growing in number because they're starting to use yes. IEW. Of course, that's the <laughs> that's the secret ingredient of right course. there yes, to yes. quality education. But So that's one way to think of it, and we always have to understand that's a viable possibility. Mm-hmm, sure. Another way to think about it is to reflect on the fact that there are lots and lots of students coming out of high school, into the workplace, into junior colleges and universities with not that exceptionally stunning skills and knowledge. It's it's a lower bar today mm-hmm. than it was, say, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. In fact, really, objectively, if you were to compare a bachelor's degree requirements mm-hmm. today with a high school diploma from, say, the 1920s, Hmm. they're about the same level of rigor. Hmm. So you could say, well, you know, we'll just do the best we can and we'll probably be equal or ahead of most everybody else. Right. So the definition of quality could vary from decade to decade. Definitely could vary. You know, I often tell the story that I have two children who didn't do huge chunks of high school for various reasons. And both did extremely well in the university and in life. One of them just dropped out of high school at 14 and a half, decided to start at the University of Idaho, study for the SAT, got a high score, got a full scholarship. And to this day, though she has a bachelor's degree in theology, she does not yet have a high school diploma. (laughs) I think that counts. I think you can double dip there. Can you there? (laughs) I have another child of mine who, for various reasons, needed to leave and go to a kind of special place to work on character and life and get through the difficult phase of teenagerhood. She didn't do, I think, any academics for 18 months. And yet she came back, she applied herself, she got into Biola, did very, very well there. So I'm pretty convinced that you could miss huge chunks of your high school time period in terms of academics, and be just fine in the world. The third option, which I think is the best, is, of course, look at the resources that are available to you. Mm -hmm. There are a plethora of opportunities for high school students now that did not exist even 10 years ago and certainly not 20 years ago. Right. There are hybrid schools 
that the students can attend two days a week with professional teachers, and they have the external accountability that parents so often desire at that age. There's also online classes ranging from universities that offer online classes for a dual enrollment to our online classes. I was just going to say, we have online classes uh, too. Teaching writing. I got friends who teach classics, Latin, Greek, trigonometry and calculus, Mm -hmm. really any subject that is kind of a concern to a mother, I think they could, if they search, find good online classes to fill in that perceived gap. Mm -hmm. And that could be combined, of course, with the idea of actually a dual enrollment, taking classes at the junior college. Mm -hmm. It's a safe environment. If you get a lame teacher, you can drop the class. You don't lose a bunch of money. And honestly, half of the 16-year-old homeschool kids I know are probably going to do just as well as most of the 19-year-olds who who are there. And so you can combine efforts, dual enrollment, bank credits. And if you wanted some coaching on that side, then I would recommend College Plus. Lumerit Scholars. It's, it's Lumerit Scholars. That's right. They I think they still have College Plus website, but mm-hmm. Lumerit Scholars. And that's what they do is they provide individual coaching so that high school students or anyone mm-hmm. can acquire college accredited college and university credits through these types of systems, supplement with CLEP tests, mm-hmm. AP exams, and all of that. So, you know, that's a third way to think about it. But I I would finish up this answer by saying, I think having pretty much all grown children now, and and you do too, so you can concur or disagree with me. But in retrospect, I really look and see that academics is kind of the least important part of growing up. It's Mm -hmm. important, Mm -hmm. but it's the least important. What really matters? Character development, entrepreneurial spirit and opportunity, gaining independence, you know, all of those things that we like to see in our children. Oftentimes, we're so busy with, quote, school, right? we don't have time to let them do those other things. Right. So a modicum of, of freedom is perhaps, and then we could go all the way over to some of the unschoolers and John Taylor Gatto and Mm -hmm. people who say, you know, if you just let kids pursue their passion, pursue their interests, they'll (laughs) self-educate. And there are many cases in the world where we've seen that. Yes. And of course, everything uh, is going to depend on the personality and character of the student, the goals and, and stress levels of the parents. And the good thing is there's just so many options. I think that anyone can indeed give an opportunity for their high school student to get a quality education. Super. Okay, I have another question. Rory asks, I wondered if anyone has ever offered a class to public or private school students outside of school. I know several students who would benefit that do not homeschool. I wonder if she's thinking specifically of writing. Well, I'm assuming that she's asking us that question. Right. There are, of course, any number of people who offer things like Kumon Math, mm-hmm. Mathnasium, Sylvan Learning Center, We had a friend in Canada who offered after-school writing classes along that same model, trying to build that as a business. I, the first class I taught, the very first class of students I ever taught, actually was an after-school class because I had one daughter who was enrolled in middle school and another daughter at home, Mm -hmm. and I got them and their friends and had a little gaggle of, you know... (laughs) 10, 11, 12-year-old girls, and I taught that first year. It certainly is a case where parents who perceive the benefit would be willing to take the time and money to do that. Mm -hmm. In terms of do we know anyone specific in your area, the best we can do in those cases, isn't it uh, refer people to our accredited instructor? 
page? Right. I was going to suggest two options. One is we do offer online classes, as we mentioned before. And at all hours. And we do, yeah, yes. because we have teachers that are on the West Coast, on the East Coast. and Students on the other side of the planet. It's true. Right? And yeah. sometimes those students have to get up pretty early or stay up pretty late to take their live classes. But if they don't make it live, they can get the recording. That's always an option. Our online classes whether or not you can attend live. The other thing is, as you mentioned, our instructor accreditation program, where you can actually find an instructor in your area. So we'll just give a link to that in the show notes. And on the outside chance that Rory herself is thinking, could I do this? Mm -hmm. The answer, of course, is absolutely. Get your instructor accreditation and find those people that you know who would benefit from that thing and start a class yourself. And maybe start a second or a third or a fourth. Right. (laughs) Who knows? Could become a full-time job. Right. And I think of the homeschooling moms that are homeschooling mom emeritus like I am. That could be a little business or it could be a big business. We know people that Well, that's great, but don't you get any ideas. (laughs) Okay. Thanks, boss. (laughs) Okay. So the next question is from Charity. She asks, my daughter will be participating in the IEW portion of Essentials with Classical Conversations. Mm Mm-hmm. As a first-time mom teaching IEW, what can I do now to start preparing myself for next year? That's a softball question right there. <laughs> the answer always is do the teaching, writing, structure, and style course. Yes. That is our foundation. That is our flagship product. That is the core of what we do. And while the Essentials Tutors are required to complete that course in order to be tutoring and teaching in the program of Classical Conversations, Mm -hmm. the more moms who have completed that course, the better. And in fact, Charity, go all the way. Do the practicum exercises. When it says turn off the video, make this outline, do it. When it says turn off the video, write this paragraph, do it. If you do all those practicum exercises, well, what will happen? you will deeply understand the program. You will be extremely well prepared to help all your children in essentials or wherever you find yourself over the coming years or decades. The Probably the, the one thing, you know, when we meet parents who feel unsure of what, you know, how to help, is they either didn't watch the TWSS right. or... They watched it while they were folding laundry, and when it said, do the exercise, they said, I don't really need to. And they got all the way through, but didn't just jump in and wrestle with it. Mm -hmm. It's You just got to get in the pit and wrestle the alligators of structure and style. (laughs) And once you subjugate them, (laughs) then you are a master and you can teach with great confidence. So that is an easy question although it may not be the answer Charity wanted to hear. (laughs) Right. Well, you say wrestling alligators. I think more like you're wrestling book lice and elephants. It's not really that hard. Okay. (laughs) I think some people would prefer alligator over book lice and elephants, but you have it there. Yes. Okay, Lorraine asks, what are your favorite sources for historical fiction? Well, I'm going to assume that Lorraine is talking about just reading mm-hmm. historical fiction, not using it as a source text or a platform for writing mm-hmm. assignments or projects. And I do strongly encourage historical fiction. In fact, you know, if I ask my adult children, you know, where did you learn your history? It's all from those books on the shelves, you right. know, the Vienna Prelude and the Boney Tatey series and the Henley books. And <laughs> you can understand how the narrative and the the excitement of a story will reside. It will remain in the imagination of the student. Mm-hmm. So you actually learn more about, say, the revolutionary time period by reading Johnny Tremaine than by reading a bunch of facts about that period. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. the facts, you may hold them long enough to pass a quiz, but if there's no relevance, if there's nothing connecting it to your imagination and your memory, they'll disappear unless reinforced with high repetition. Whereas you can read a historical fiction book, and yeah, it's a fiction book, so there's characters that aren't real, 
But then there's that whole context, that time period, the geography, the famous people, the events that happen that really locks it in. What are my favorite sources? Well, there's so many. It's it's like saying, <laughs> what's your favorite food in the whole world? You know, there's too many. Right. You kind of need a guide. You need mm-hmm. a menu. One book that we published, mm-hmm. Timeline of Classics, compiled by Gail Ledbetter, I think is an excellent resource. Gail started putting her book list together because she began to realize that younger moms didn't really know what to look for. And they'd go to the library, but they wouldn't know what to get. And of course, libraries these days are not nearly as safe as they once used to be. Browsing the shelves of the young adult section is not something a lot of people think is a good use of time. If you know what books you want and you can get them, okay. So Gail put together her list for some of the younger moms that she was noticing didn't weren't well read themselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people say, sure. I, I didn't read a lot of books growing up. I don't know what's good. And uh, they're all organized through date. So that's why it's timeline of classics. So it starts with the ancient and move up through and then into the early medieval, mid-medieval, late medieval, Renaissance, Reformation, and and then into the modern period. And the books are either set in that time period or written in that time period. Right. And then they're also organized into elementary reading level, basically kind of a middle school reading level and a high school reading level. Right. It's a tremendous resource. It's well worth the 30 bucks or whatever it costs because it's something you use your whole your whole life. Mm-hmm. So that would be one place to go. My son, who didn't read much at all until he was a teenager, probably in a way is the most literate of all the children because he listened to so many books. Right. And one of the kind of favorites of homeschoolers are the Henty mm-hmm. books. Their vocabulary is just exhaustive. They're spanning great huge chunks of history. Mm-hmm. There's dozens and dozens. I don't even know how many there are. And the audiobooks are a little easier for a lot of students at that age. They can listen to literature that is above their decoding skills, especially if they might have a bit of dyslexia, such as my son. So Jim Hodges Mm -hmm. has recorded many of those audiobooks, and I think it's Jim Hodges Productions. or Right, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, those are, I think, a great value Mm -hmm. for students and historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And he's got a great, soothing voice. He does have a very Mm -hmm. nice voice, Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so speaking of dyslexia, dyslexic students, Margaret has a question. She says, I'm tutoring a nine-year-old dyslexic student. So there's your nod to the people who are taking care of perhaps students that are in school, right? Yeah. There's, Margaret's doing that very thing. Thank you, Margaret, for that. I'm tutoring a nine-year-old dyslexic student that is completely overwhelmed and discouraged. He says he is always a loser and will never do anything right. How do you stop the overwhelmed downwards spiral? It is sad to see a student without hope. Yeah, that's a that's such a tough situation. Mm-hmm. It's I think even harder when your time with that student is limited. It's minimal. If you're a tutor, mm-hmm. how many hours a week, you know, do you really see them and mm-hmm. what's the dynamic, you know, with mom and the home and the mm-hmm. expectations and it, it is a very very difficult situation. Mm-hmm. The world of education as we see it today is extremely invested in reading Mm -hmm. because of the need for schools and states to have standardized tests. And of course, you can't take a standardized test unless you can read it. Mm -hmm. And so reading becomes kind of the idol. If kids will just read, then our problems are solved. And yet there are some students who just can't and aren't going to read no matter what you do. As you know, my son, Scott Christopher, didn't read anything until he was 11 years old. Didn't mm-hmm. read a book until he was 12. And when he was 9 years old, there is no way he was going to read anything. Right. And of course, it's very frustrating for the mm-hmm. parents. You mm-hmm. you know, use this phonic system and that phonic system, and you pay a lot of money to something like Linda Mood Bell or Barton, or, and you're trying all of these things to try and get over this hump of of dyslexia, inability to read, lack of confidence, hatred of the thing. Yeah. 
And you still fail after three or four years of banging your head against the wall. And probably spending a lot of money, too. Yeah. So it's it's just awful. And I don't have a solution exactly for Margaret, mm-hmm. but there are some basic principles. Mm-hmm. One thing to remember is that this student is not the only boy in the world who is not reading and may not read until he's older. Mm-hmm. I know personally five men with advanced degrees, two of whom have PhD degrees, who didn't read a book till they were teenagers. Mm. It is not uncommon to meet men who did not read at that age. And one of the problems of our modern education is we tend to compare children with other people's children. We compare the boys and the girls, we compare all the nine-year-olds, we... Mm-hmm. And, and somehow this idea that, oh, no, this child is behind, well, that seeps right through to them. And if you're behind, right. that means you're not good. If you're not good at something, it means you should quit. And I think that one, one thing I would love to suggest, if Margaret is listening, if the mother of this student could perhaps also listen to my talk on teaching boys and other children who would rather be making forts all day. Right. Because the whole second half of that is about the basic principles, the laws of motivation. Mm -hmm. And when you're failing in something, whether you are or not, if you think you're failing in something, then you're going to not want to do that thing. Mm -hmm. And then the not willingness to do it becomes a greater sense of failure. You fall, quote, further behind, so you hate it more, and so pretty soon you're you're in a, a complete unwillingness to even try. That would be me with mm. snowboarding, <laughs> right? Because why? When I went snowboarding, it was such a horrible, awful, miserable, painful, embarrassing, terrible experience. I don't want to do it again. Right. And the great thing about being me is I don't have to. Right. Nobody's going to make me. <laughs> do something that I know I'm bad at. But what's funny is, you know, my kids will say, come on, Dad, you could do it. If you just try, Mm -hmm. we know you could do it if you just try. And, of course, my attitude is, forget it. I'm not going there. You go to the snow with your mother, have fun. I'll go fly somewhere and and teach a seminar to pay for your stupid trip, you know. (laughs) So I I have a bad attitude. But, see... We have to think, okay, how many times have we been on the other side of that? Right. Saying things like to a kid, Mm -hmm. if I know you could do this if you would just try. Mm -hmm. The most useless thing you could ever say to motivate a student. So what's the trick? You got to back all the way up and find something the student can do and be successful with that. The three laws of motivation. And we have podcasts on all this, right? Yes, yes, we do. So get those links up there. Students like to do what they can do. They want to do what they think they can do. And they hate and will refuse to do what they cannot do or what they believe they cannot do. Right. And our opinion about that is irrelevant. So, you know, I don't have a solution. I will say this. I don't know if Margaret has used our writing approach with Mm -hmm. this particular child But we have a tremendous record of success Mm -hmm. with dyslexic, hyperactive, auditory processing issues, even autistic kids. We have a tremendous success with our system of keyword outlines, introducing, source text, retelling, and moving through the structure and style syllabus. Right. And you talk about going all the way back with our system. You can go all the way back to the very basic steps, and the kids can be successful. Yeah. And the other thing that bears on this is the four deadly errors. Mm -hmm. One of them, of course, is withholding help. Mm -hmm. So especially with a child who's feeling like a loser and will never do anything right, how do you get past that? Do it together. Right. Do it together. Do do everything together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they start to feel like, okay, I know what I'm doing. This right. isn't so bad. You say, you have to do that by yourself or you're not learning. You're not getting value. Well, that's when you get into this situation. Right, right. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Just one more? <laughs> well. <laughs> we have to do a a a a a part two. <laughs> Maybe that'll be episode 90. <laughs> okay, Jennifer asks, how often should I do the program. (laughs) Well, 
the answer is always in an ideal situation you do something every day right that's in an ideal circumstance that doesn't always happen and it doesn't necessarily meet everyone's style some people might be great scheduling themselves to do 20 minutes of writing every day for five days Mm -hmm. or a classroom might have a period Mm -hmm. and we do writing during this time every day these days of the week or whatever Mm -hmm. other people kind of do better when they go in spurts or bursts and wow this is going so well let's just keep going and finish the whole project and it took two and a half hours Mm -hmm. and uh uh-oh we didn't do these other things so then maybe you wouldn't do the writing the rest of the week or maybe you would take a couple days and then start a new project so it could it could just be anywhere Mm -hmm. but i think ideally if we want to improve consistently We do a little bit, at least, of something every day. That's Mm -hmm. the best way to go. Now, you know and I know that children are as good at procrastinating, or maybe even better, than we are. (laughs) And so when you have a class and you say, okay, here's the class, here's the assignment, well, usually the next time they think about that Mm -hmm. is the night before it's due. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems I see with the kind of one day a week co-op situation. And that's where I would say, okay, moms get involved and try to work on each, you know, try to work on these assignments a little bit each day until it's done so that you don't have to be messing with the thing at 10 o'clock Sunday night. Yes, because two and a half hours, 10 o'clock Sunday night equals 1230 Monday morning. That is not a good And that equals a a crabby, unhappy, inattentive child the next day for class. That discipline, too, of doing a little bit every day. Yep, yep. You know I taught swimming lessons. It was one of my very first jobs. That's right. Recreation specialist. Yes, right. That's right. And I taught classes Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, or Tuesday, Thursdays. That's when the students had the opportunity. And the Tuesday, Thursday classes were a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But the students who took classes every day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for 30 minutes, improved much faster than those students who did 45 minutes a day on Tuesdays Tuesday, and Thursday. Thursday. Sure. So that little bit every day can really... Well, improve. and that's really the key to learning anything is spaced repetition versus cramming. Right. I guess, though, your swimming students didn't have homework. So. Well, it, it was called free swim, right? Rec- rec- oh. And I'm also thinking of your talk on skills and how ING is a skill. So swimming and writing, I would imagine, have similar... And drawing and playing right. a musical instrument. Yeah, do a little bit every day. doing a sport, yeah, a little yeah. bit every day. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been great. Thanks so much for answering all these questions. And where do people send a question if they want to get theirs in the next podcast? Right. We have a really easy email to remember. It's podcast at IEW.com. Couldn't be easier. Even I could remember that. Yes, I think so. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on this educational journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.